All right, thank you, Evan. Um, so this is a topic I'm super excited to talk about. Uh, this is a problem we've been trying to solve for a number of years now, and we finally, I think, have a viable, uh, robust solution to steering multiple users immersed in the same physical environment. Uh, and I unfortunately don't have a lot of time to dig into exactly how redirected walking works and kind of the, the nuts and bolts of it, but uh, the general theory is that we want to give people the ability to physically walk and navigate through very large virtual environments, such as a, a full-scale grocery store, um, and allow them to kind of wander, you can see the blue path there, explore the entire store while physically being situated in a much smaller space and just kind of walking in circles. Uh, occasionally they will hit the walls uh, and we switch from a redirected walking algorithm to a resetting algorithm and get them turned around uh, so they can continue on their way. Uh, and when you think about uh, the way this works, um, you know, we're, we're taking people and generally when you talk about generalized redirected walking, we're always trying to pull them towards some area. Sometimes that's a, a point in the middle of the room or a set of waypoints um, or some kind of idealized path like an orbit or a figure eight, something like that. Uh, and this works really well uh, as long as you have one person. Uh, if you happen to have five people in the same room and you're pulling them all to the center, uh, that causes a problem, right? We're actually causing collisions, we're not preventing collisions. Um, and ideally, what we'd like to do is, you know, we're already steering people uh, away from obstacles, we're steering them into open space. Uh, it seems intuitive that we should be able to kind of weave people in and around each other and guide them uh, successfully, you know, into open space, even though there's other people in the room. So um, one thing you can do is think about subdividing the space. Uh, you could either physically kind of divide up the space and have one user has the left half of the room, one user has the right half of the room. That's really not ideal. We want to kind of maximize the amount of physical tracking space that people can, can wander through. Um, a kind of more subtle solution is to give people their own kind of offset center. So we steer people to slightly different center points in the room. Um, that still does nothing to prevent them from colliding other than right at that center point. And it really doesn't scale well, right? So if you start adding more and more users, the offset centers kind of get more dispersed and closer and closer to the walls. Um, we actually tried to take this approach a number of years ago. Uh, one of our grad students at Miami, Jeanette Holm, uh, took this kind of modified steer to center approach and tried to extend it to uh, work with multiple users. And that involved kind of, you know, at first separating, giving an offset center for each user and then starting to predict where the user was gonna go, right? So, uh, we take kind of their velocity and position and predict out several seconds where we think they're going to end up. Uh, this is kind of a hard problem. Human navigation is fairly uncertain. We don't know where they're going to go. Uh, but we're actually able to use the fact that we're actively redirecting the user to have a pretty good guess, right? Wherever they try to go in the virtual world, we're going to redirect them along a certain path. So uh, Jeanette was able to actually predict um, about four to eight seconds into the future if there was likely going to be a collision. Uh, again, there's a lot of uncertainty there. You start getting into false alarm rates of like 30, 50, 70 percent, uh, the further out you go. Um, and really four, five, six seconds is not a huge time window to correct a collision uh, if it is going to happen. Uh, but what she did was actually, uh, when a collision was deemed likely, she would turn off steer to center and switch to kind of this avoidance algorithm. So she would generate a point to the left and right of each user, uh, figure out which of those four points is furthest apart, and then kind of swing the users past each other. Uh, and this worked really well uh, most of the time. <laughs> there were a lot of failure cases, edge cases. So she actually did a lot of work kind of predicting the type of collision, head on, side on, uh, rear ending, uh, what direction the users were currently being steered uh, versus the avoidance steering. And this got really complicated really fast. Uh, not to mention that uh, as soon as you add a third user, the entire thing falls apart, right? So there's a lot of circumstances where any action you take to swing two users away from each other sends one of them into a third user or one of them into a wall or both, right? Uh, so we actually abandoned this very quickly. It was clear that it wasn't going to be a tenable solution. Uh, which brings us to artificial potential fields. Uh, Joe gave a nice introduction to it earlier. Um, we want to have, instead of waiting for this narrow window where it's like, ah, a collision's about to happen, we need to avoid it, we want to kind of continually have users just repelling each other. Um, and the, the gradients are a very nice way to, to visualize that. Another way kind of metaphorically to think about artificial potential field is uh, if there were springs connecting the user to the walls and to each other, and as you get closer and closer to a wall, the spring is going to load up and just push harder and harder, right? So proximity um, kind of generates more force and pushes you away. 
And if you're far away, like I'm very far away from the rear wall, it's going to have very little influence on me. It's not going to be pushing very hard. Uh, so in practice, this looks like this. If you have a, two users uh, in a space, um, you're adding up five force vectors. So you have four walls pushing on you and one other user. Computationally, this is very, 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 very simple, right? You add five things together, the resulting force vector points towards kind of the best uh, path of least resistance at that moment. Um, so you can dynamically generate this every single frame. You can add in lots and lots of users and uh, add up the force vectors. And uh, again, you can calculate kind of the, the gradient for the entire room, any point in the room to show you where the best place is. Uh, oftentimes that will be the center of the room, but there are cases where you might have an area of low resistance kind of circling around behind a user um, or depending on the shape of the room, right, you can go different areas. Uh, so we wanted to, to actually implement this and try this um, both with single users just to kind of benchmark it against known methods uh, and then also to, to try it uh, with multiple users and especially with more than two users. We don't want to be stuck in a situation where multi-user is technically like two users uh, and then it all falls apart. Um, we don't want to be stuck there again. Uh, so um, we'll get into to that here in a minute. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, at Miami University, we have a facility called The Hive, and my video is not playing here. That's fantastic. All right, so you can imagine a video playing here where we have three users wandering through a space. Uh, they're wearing an Oculus Rift and a, a backpack that has a, a rendering laptop on it. And um, we gave them a task that was basically to uh, walk through a very simple grassy field. There were colored posts off in the distance of various colors. Uh, different colors were worth different amounts of points. They had no idea of the point values of each color. So they played a little game where they had to try to maximize their points by discovering what things were worth and get as many points as they could uh, within four minutes. Uh, and we did this sometimes steering with artificial potential fields, sometimes with steer to center, sometimes with no steering at all and just resets. And to kind of keep things on an, um, an equal basis, anytime in any of the conditions people reached a wall, we would put up a stop sign and we would redirect them in the direction of the force gradient. Uh, we hadn't read Gerald's paper yet, so we didn't know that was suboptimal, but we would steer them in the kind of what we thought was the, the best direction here. Um, for single users, um, kind of surprised us, uh, it actually turned out significantly better than steer to center. So steer to center is known to work really well in open, kind of unconstrained virtual environments. Uh, the number of resets that we were getting with artificial potential field was actually smaller, um, so it was three times more uh, interruptions, more resets with steer to center than we saw with artificial potential fields. And a lot of that's driven by the fact that we have a, a long rectangular tracking space, so users were able to kind of freely disperse along the long axis rather than constantly trying to pull them around and, and not using the larger area of the space. Uh, but also um, because since artificial potential field is aware of the walls and it scales up based on proximity, uh, we are able to very temporarily exceed perceptual thresholds when a reset is imminent. So we felt that um, kind of temporarily cranking people around and getting them turned away from the wall was less of an interruption than stopping them going through a reset procedure. Uh, so we're actually able to dramatically uh, reduce the number of resets and let people explore over much longer distances. So we had people walking about a half a kilometer uh, during this experiment. Um, I'll also point out that this was fairly consistent um, it wasn't just on average that artificial potential field was better, but we actually only had one participant out of 20 who had more resets with artificial potential field. Uh, as far as multiple users, we did run people in sets of either two or three at a time. And again, we saw very low resets. Um, so on average, in four minutes of walking, they would have about one, just over one reset, uh, even though there's multiple people in the room. So um, I don't want you to get too hung up on the, the size of the bars here. Um, we, we are uh, comparing to a, a no redirection condition, so um, steering people is better than not steering people. That shouldn't surprise anyone. Um, unfortunately, there is no other multi-user redirected walking algorithm we can benchmark against, against so this was kind of the, the best we had. But uh, really the take-home message here is that it, it worked. It worked really well. We were able to dramatically reduce the resets. We didn't have people, it didn't all fall apart when we put in a third user. That was kind of the, the nice thing. Um, and uh, from there, we kind of extended things with a, a simulated experiment. So uh, our original intention was to actually run up to four or five, six live users. We wanted to see how far we could push this thing, uh, but our tracking system did not cooperate. So a lot of the optimizations that we did to 
allow the, the optical tracking to work in a very large space over long distances with a shiny high gloss floor, uh, filter out reflections, um, made it all break when we put in four trackers at the same time. Uh, it kept thinking that some of the extra trackers were reflections and it would filter them out and we'd lose people. Uh, so instead we, we simulated, um, we took uh, 52 paths that we had recorded from the live users and we kind of mixed them and matched them together in different combinations uh, to see what would happen if they had been in the, in the room together trying to walk the same path in the virtual world. And uh, this is showing kind of a combination of the number of wall resets plus the number of user-to-user uh, -user resets. And uh, the encouraging thing here is this doesn't all explode. It's not like some exponential increase in collisions as you add more and more bodies to the room. It's just kind of a nice uh, gradual increase here. Um, when people are not being steered, they're just being reset. Uh, you're actually getting so high in the total number of collisions. Uh, in four minutes, they're having about 12 collisions total. So that's like every 20 seconds. Uh, they're bouncing off each other so much that the number of wall collisions actually decreases as you add more people because they're spending all of their time resetting and they're not walking very far. Um, and one thing we saw fairly consistently across a lot of the measures was that uh, you can actually get up to about eight simultaneous users in our gym uh, before you get back to the level of performance that you would get with one user who had no intervention was not being steered. Um, that's not a great place to be, right? Like that's the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, so it is kind of helpful to maybe start from a, uh, a lower threshold. Um, we'll see in the next talk. Uh, we kind of conceptualize of if we can get people down to like one reset per minute, so four resets total, uh, we could probably support about five simultaneous users in our gym and steer them around each other successfully. Uh, another thing that, that we saw, uh, again, you can see here, um, getting the same pattern with the distance walked, uh, one, people, uh, one person unsteered and eight people steered have about the same performance. Um, but a big thing we saw in several of the um, pieces of data is that there is kind of a big difference between having one user versus just a couple users versus a lot of users. So the biggest uh, performance penalty is when you start adding two or three users. Obviously the space goes down, there's a lot of constraints. Uh, but going, for example, from four to eight users, there's really not that much more of a performance penalty. Um, so in conclusion, I would say that uh, this, this approach works extremely well for multiple users. It scale, scales nicely. It does not fall apart when you start adding that third or fourth user. Um, you'll notice I don't have a slide here of all the edge cases and failure cases where it falls apart and we have to take other uh, approaches. Um, and it is just extremely computationally simple. Um, I'd like to thank the folks in robotics for solving all of our problems. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's all I have. So if you have uh, questions, I can answer questions. Interesting work, and thanks for saying thanks to us because I'm from, I'm like, I do research in robotics. <laughs> and um, my question is um, for the repulsion forces, what kind of a drop off functions you have used? Um, so I'd refer you to the paper for that, that it goes through the mathematics in detail. Okay. So, yeah. And um, is that the um, drop off function is same for the um, rigid, rigid obstacles compared to the dynamic obstacles? Uh, yes, actually, that's a great question. So this is tunable. Uh, mm -hmm. If you put more weight on user-to-user -user interaction, mm -hmm. um, you can have the users repel each other more, but you're going to okay. end up pushing them into the walls. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have stronger forces on the walls, you'll keep them away from the walls, but push them more towards each other. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a uh, up to the developer where you want to put that balance. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Yes. So I'd like to ask you a question. Okay. Um, so obviously, the high is a fantastic space to be able to finally do you're one of the few places that can actually do a live user experiment with multi-user reactive water. Yes. Do you think that there's any hope? Uh, will everyone who wants to do two or more users in redirected walking need a space like that? Or do you think there's hope it can work in spaces that are potentially like still large but smaller? And if so, is there like a range? Do you have an intuition about the range of spaces it might work in? Yes. Um, so that's a perfect segue to the next paper. <laughs> um, so one of the things you can do is simulate your space. Um, like we saw with kind of the follow-up functions is trying to figure out how many people will fit in your space before you start to exceed the number of resets you're comfortable with. So, yeah. Thank you. We have, do you have 30 seconds more for another question? So, I'll ask you a question. So, Eric, so, great talk. Oh, so. um, does your system distinguish between user resets and wall resets? Because user resets, if I understood you correctly, those kind of go away on their own, right? Okay, because 
No, uh, so we did have user resets. If people got too close to each other and we weren't comfortable with them swinging past each other, we would stop them and go into the reset procedure. Um, so we did distinguish between those. Okay, yeah. Yes, so you potentially could do that. So how do you yeah. both people reset though? Yeah, um, you can kind of think of this as a, a first simple implementation, proof of concept. So there are a lot of ways you could improve the reset procedure or um, we actually didn't do things like implementing distance gains. So you could slow a person down to let someone walk on by, for example, and not have to do a reset. Um, there's probably a lot of ways you could optimize this. Uh, we were just kind of keeping things simple to kind of make sure it worked first. Thank you.